جزاك الله خير الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والرسل محمد بن عبد الله وعلى صاحبه أصحابه وأزواره وسلم The reason this topic is very important is because the religion, the religion of Islam is summed up in one word in the vocabulary of Islam, and that is the Sharia, the Shara, or the way in which we are taught by the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to act in this world. The Islamic law covers all possible actions of every man and woman in this life. And it, it alone determines whether those actions are acceptable and pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or whether those actions are unacceptable. Only by comparing our words and our deeds to the example of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam can we know whether what we are doing and saying is a deed that will raise us give us entrance into paradise and raise our level to a higher level or is it something that will threaten to condemn us وَعَوْذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ النَّارِ by doing that which is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, the religion of Islam is contained in the Sharia or the law of Islam. The religion of Islam isn't just doctrines and creeds. And of course, doctrines and creeds are a very important part of the deen. But the religion of Islam is actions and words based on ikhlas in the heart, devotion in the heart to Allah alone, devotion of the body in our outward actions, and the devotion in our heart of our inward actions and things to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So we cannot talk about Islam without talking about the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala contained in the Quran and in the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa As it has been interpreted correctly by the early generations the Sahaba who witnessed the revelation, the Tabi'een, the second generation, and the Tabi'een, Tabi the third generation of scholars. So the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said, we're the best generation. The reason we go back to the interpretation of those early generations is that even the scholars of very olden times in Islam noticed that over time language evolved and people start to give new meanings and interpretations to words. They start using the same words in different ways. And if we, we don't guard to protect the original meanings of the Quran and the Sunnah, then we lose the true meaning in which it was intended. That's why we have to guard our interpretation that it is according to the interpretation of the early generations who understood that in, in the original tongue. Islam, of course, as we know, it's a religion which is now in its 15th century. And yet we claim that Islam, as is evidenced by the, our presence here in a, in a mosque, is a religion which is for all times and places. The only way that we can practice this faith in what is now nearly the 21st century of the Christian era is by having a firm foundation in true Islamic knowledge. If we interpret Islam according to our whims and desires, according to whatever occurs to us when we read books or, or hear from our friends and neighbors, then all of us are going to make up their own versions of Islam. And instead of having one religion of Islam, we will have one billion different versions. In fact, sometimes when I meet Christian uh, ministers and people who we work with sometimes in America, I find that's at least true in that religion. That there are so many, there's such a laxity of, of uh, authoritative interpretation these days 
that every single person, even within the same denomination, has totally different beliefs and practices. And this is unacceptable. Because we claim that the religion of Islam is the true religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could only have one religion, since he is one ilah, one God. Because the whole concept of religion is doing the actions which are pleasing to him and following his will. And of course he has one will for all human beings. But today, Islam is under threat from all directions. Anti-Islamic forces are destroying the reality of the foundation of Islam. Not only for the people who are living here as a minority, but throughout the very central areas of the Islamic world. The enemies of Islam have targeted the destruction of Islam, not in name, but in meaning. It's not their intention that every Muslim will convert to Christianity or some other religion or renounce Islam or that mosques will be destroyed and people will be forced to change their religion. That's not the intention of the people who are the opponents of Islam in this world. The intention is that Islam will be destroyed in its meaning but we will go on being Muslims and claim that we are following the religion of Islam and we'll pray and we'll fast but the meaning will be lost. We have though people whom Allah subhanahu wa raises up in every generation as guardians of the faith of Islam. They are the ulama, the scholars of Islam, who have inherited the inheritance of the prophets, alayhim salam. Because the prophets didn't leave gold and silver, dirhams and dinar, they left the knowledge. And the people who have inherited that knowledge are those people who are the guardians of Islam in its word and in its true meaning. The meaning which is in accordance with the Salaf of the Ummah, the first early generations of the Ummah. Without having those scholars who refuse to compromise, we will lose the actual foundation of the true unalterable meaning of the religion of Islam. It is not possible for someone to be a scholar and yet compromise with the truth. Because when we do that, when we become flexible, then we lose the original. And we create a new version, an evolved version of the original religion of Islam. But the scholars are a very small minority in the Islamic world today. If you would have traveled throughout the Muslim world, a couple of centuries ago, you would have seen in every large Muslim city dozens of Islamic colleges that were set up, which were called the Madaris, the Madrasa. They were the colleges of Islamic theology. They were set up as independent oqaf or foundations. The independent foundations owned property by which they could be sustained without depending on receiving money from the government. So the Oqaf produced, researched the religion of Islam and produced the ulama without any pressures from government sources because they were not dependent on outside sources for their income. But as part of the modernization and westernization of the Islamic world, the Oqaf in virtually every Muslim country were seized by the authorities and all their properties, whether they were farm properties or marketplaces, or real estate which, from which they derived their income, they were seized. All that was taken away by the government, sold or turned into museums, or turned into mosques, which were only used for worship, but in which study of Islam did not take place. So in countries, for example, the city of Cairo, where there are at least 100 different Islamic colleges, today of course there's one. In the city of Mecca, where there were 40 Islamic colleges, of course, there are two or three, and many cities that had quite a few of those colleges, or at least one, today have nothing. So the ulama today are much smaller in number than they were in previous eras. And also the ulama are totally dependent on the various governments for their livelihood and for their freedom. Because 
if they say what is not pleasing to the ruler, if they speak the truth and people, and people need to hear, they're imprisoned or tortured or killed. So they're in an unenviable position if you look at it from the worldly perspective in that doing their duty causes them to lose the most precious things, their lives and their freedom. But they have themselves chosen this path. They have chosen the path of speaking up and standing up for the truth, regardless of consequences. And therefore, we must be thankful that we have people like this in our day and time, from whom we can get the word straight, who will receive no rewards in this life. They will receive no 